One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or from human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, Why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, We don't know where it was from. Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit from the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give those vineyards to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, so they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius, whose image and inscription are on it? Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public, and astonished by his answer, they became silent. And the Old Testament reading, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace in the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father, David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incenses on high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have given this great kindness to him and have given him his son to sit on the throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, not have asked for death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke, and he realized it had been a dream. 
He returned to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court. Now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One of them said, Pardon me, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There was no one in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. So she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. She put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. The next morning I got up to nurse my son and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. The other woman said, No, the living one is my son, the dead one is yours. But the first one insisted, No, the dead one is yours, the living one is mine. And so they argued before the king. The king said, This one says, My son is alive and your son is dead. While that one says, No, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, Bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king. He then gave an order, Cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, Please, my lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, Neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. Then the king gave his ruling, Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is the mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. So King Solomon ruled over all Israel, and these were his chief officials. Azariah, son of Zadok, the priest. Elilraph and Ajiha, sons of Shisha, secretaries. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, recorder. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, commander-in-chief. Zadok and Abiathar, priests. Azariah, son of Nathan, in charge of the district governors. Zabud, son of Nathan, a priest and advisor to the king. Ahisha, palace administrator. Adoniram, son of Abda, in charge of forced labor. Solomon had twelve district governors over all Israel who supplied provisions for the kings and royal households. Each one had to provide supplies for one month in the year. These are their names. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim. Ben Dekur and Mekah, Shalbim, Beth Shemesh, and Elon Bethanan. Ben Hesed in Arabath, Succoth, and all the lands of Hefer were his. Ben Abinadab in the four door, he was married to Tapath, daughter of Solomon. Bana, son of Ahulud, in Tanakh and Megiddo, and in all of Beth Shan, next to Zarahan, below Jezreel, from Beth Shan to Abel Mahela, across to Jokmin. Ben Jeber in Ramoth, Gilead, the settlements of Jer, son of Manasseh, and Gilead were his, as well as the region of Argob in Bashan and its sixty large walled cities with bronze gate bars. Ahinadab, son of Edo, in Manaheim. Ahimaz in Naphtali, he had married Basemath, daughter of Solomon. Bana, son of Hushai, in Asher and Aloth. Jehoshaphat, son of Perua, in Issachar. Shimel, son of Elah, in Benjamin. Geber, son of Uri and Gilead, the country of Shion, king of Amorites, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. He was the only governor over the district. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were happy. And Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subjects all his life. Solomon's daily provisions were 30 cores of the finest flour and 60 cores of meal, 10 head of stall-fed cattle, 20 of pasture-fed cattle, and 100 sheep and goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl. For he ruled over all the kingdoms of the west of the Euphrates River, from Tipshah to Gaza, and had peace on all sides. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for chariot horses and 12,000 horses. The district governors, each in his month, supplied provisions for the king Solomon and all who came to the king's table. They saw to it that nothing was lacking. They also brought to the proper place their quotas of barley and straw for the chariot horses and other horses. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east and greater than the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan and Ezrahite, wiser than Hermon, 
Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his sons numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. When Hiram, king of Tyre, heard that Solomon had been anointed king to succeed his father David, he sent his envoys to Solomon. Because he had always been on friendly terms with David, Solomon sent back this message to Hiram. You know that because of the wars waged against my father David from all sides, he could not build a temple for the name of the Lord his God until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side, and there is no adversary or disaster. I intend therefore to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord told my father David when he said, Your son, whom I will put on the throne in your place, will build the temple for my name. So give orders that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me. My men will work with yours, and I will pay you for your men whatever wages you set. You know that we have no one skilled in felling timber as the Sidonians. When Hiram heard Solomon's message, he was greatly pleased and said, Praise be to the Lord today, for he has given David a wise son to rule over this great nation. So Hiram sent word to Solomon, I have received the message you sent me and will do all you want in providing the cedar and juniper logs. My men will haul them down from Lebanon to the Mediterranean Sea, and I will float them as rafts by the sea to the place you specify. There I will separate them, and you can take them away, and you are to grant my wish by providing food for my royal household. In this way, Hiram kept Solomon supplied with all the cedar and juniper logs he wanted, and Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household, in addition to 20,000 baths of pressed olive oil. Solomon continued to do this for Hiram year after year. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom just as he had promised him. There were peaceful relations between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. King Solomon conscripted laborers from all Israel, 30,000 men. He sent them off to Lebanon in shifts of 10,000 a month, so that they spent one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Had an Hiram was in charge of the forced labor, Solomon had 70,000 carriers and 80,000 stonecutters in the hills as well as 3,300 foremen who supervised the project and directed the workers. At the king's command, they removed from the quarry large blocks of high-grade stone to provide a foundation of dressed stone for the temple. The craftsmen of Solomon and Hiram and workers from Byblos cut and prepared the timber and stone for the building of the temple.